Hi, hey, welcome back. So in this section, we're working with series and the convergence of series. So um, what are these things? Infinite the series. There will be the summation things. So hopefully you've seen summation notation a little bit before. So you'll have the sum of some formula going from n equals 1 to infinity. So you're just plugging in uh, 1 for n. So instead of writing a sub n, you write a sub 1 plus a sub 2 plus a sub 3 plus all the way up to plus a sub n and then plus da da da. Okay. So that's an infinite series. Why do I want to study these things? It's because you are uh, looking at uh, trying to eventually we're going to well somebody realized that you could look at these kind of decimal values as sums so imagine 0 0.999 repeating you could actually write it as a sum right so 0 0.9 plus 0 0.09 plus 0 0.009 and so on and so forth and that but but you could also think of this as a sequence believe it or not then so how is this a sequence well you can get an approximation for 0 0.99999 by saying, all right, let's let's write uh, 0.9. That's that's a pretty good approximation for 0 0.9999. If I want a better approximation, I'll say uh, the second thing, maybe 0 0.9 plus 0 0.09, which is 0 0.99. Okay. So to study this infinitely repeating decimal, what I do is just study the sequence of what they'll call partial sums. Okay, so the third term of the sequence is basically, they're basically just approximations to the overall actual thing that, I, that I'm worried about. Right? But um, anyways, we, we've developed all this stuff about sequences in, in the first section. Now we want to apply those sequences to these series. And, you know, these series, basically what I'm saying, are these series are just sequences if you are to kind of separate them out and look at them term by term. So you could take, for example, that first infinite series thingamajig and analyze it by looking at just the, the partial sums. Like I could just look at a sub 1, and then I could look at the next term a sub 1 plus a sub 2, and then I could look at a sub 1 plus a sub 2 plus a sub 3, and then worry about where the heck that thing is going. You know, what is then the limit of s sub n as n goes to infinity, okay? And I could ask questions, does that converge? Does that diverge, right? So um, we're, we're interested in analyzing this big long sum things, and the way we're going to approach it is by uh, analyzing it as a sequence. In particular, we consider it as a sequence of partial sums. Okay, so these sequences are not your what you're used to. You're used to looking at sequences like 1, 3, 5, 7, the arithmetic or the geometric sequences. These are not like those, right? These are sums. So S sub 1 would be like the first, just the first term, S sub 2. Then we add in the second one and see what happens. And then we're adding in the third term and seeing what happens and so on and so forth, right? So maybe at the kth term, we have a sub 1 plus a sub 2 plus a sub 3 plus blah, 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 plus a sub k. And we could write that in summation notation as a sum from, um, let's see, uh, n equals 1 to k of a sub n. And then, you know, we want to look at the limit as this goes on and on forever, right? So we want the limit of S sub K, which we could write as the limit as K goes to infinity of the sum thingamajig. And then, of course, letting K go to infinity, we get the infinite series. Okay. So, you know, all that stuff we, we did in 9.1 with looking at the limits of sequences as the limit goes to infinity. You know, why are we always going to infinity? It's this. We want to analyze the heck out of these repeating decimal numbers that pop out of out of functions, um, you know, like, like uh, 
figuring out sine inverse of, of one half. What does that equal? Um, it's it's going to be some repeating decimal thingamajig, right? It's a, it's it's a, you know pi over uh, six, right? It'll be some weird repeating decimal. So what we're going to be able to do then is kind of find a way to uh, get uh, polynomials, these big, long, infinitely long polynomial sums that will equal these, these weird trig functions, and it'll give us a way of approximating them, especially for the ones we don't know how to do, right? So, for example, if you wanted to figure out what the heck is the sine of 0 0.1, well, you don't really know a reference angle for 0 0.1. You know, if it was sine of, of 0, I would know that's 0, that equals zero. If it was sine of, of pi, I would know that's equal to zero. But what about sine of point one? How do, you, you guys don't even know how to figure that out without a calculator. You know, how the heck do I do that? Well, we're gonna we're gonna figure out a way to do that in this section. It's gonna be from this uh, this idea that any any decimal you can chop it up into a bunch of a sequence of partial sums, but we'll do it more abstractly with variables. And, and we'll be able to rewrite these trig functions in terms of big, long polynomials. Okay, okay. so anyways, um, let's, let's take a look at an example. Uh, so just really simple, the sum n equals 1 to infinity of the number 1. Okay, and does this thing converge or diverge? Right. So let's look at the sequence of partial sums and see where that goes. So s sub 1 is 1. If you if you don't know how to write this out, um, it's just one plus one an infinite number of times. Okay, so s sub two is one plus one, which is two. S sub three is one plus one plus one, which is three, and so on and so forth. Right. So s sub um, k is equal to what? Well, if s sub 2 is equal to 2, s sub 3 is equal to 3, s sub k must be equal to k. And then we want the, the limit as this goes on and on forever. So the limit as k goes to infinity of this s sub k thing, well, that's just the limit as k goes to infinity of k. And of course, that's infinity. So this thing is divergent. So if you take the limit, the limit kind of represents this summation. Okay? So if the, if the limit goes to infinity or if it does not exist, you would say this thing is divergent. Otherwise, you're going to say it actually adds up to something. You'll, you'll say the sum is 5, for instance. Okay. Um, let's see the exercises. Some of these can get rather annoying. Uh, I would suggest that you... Look at um, using like Wolfram or something to to sum these guys up because it can be kind of time consuming. Uh, so, for example, this guy. Let's kind of sort of capture it, or even this one here too. Seems like I should just be able to freaking paste it in there. I apologize. Must be the other one. Oops, and I just completely screwed everything up. Sorry. It's going to force me to do it this the hard way, apparently. Let me just put it over here. Then. All right, so go to Wolfram. Um, so some of these you're not going to do on my hand, right? You're not going to add up the first 20 terms of that summation. So just go to Wolfram Alpha and do it there. So 
we could write it out um, sum three times zero point nine to the n minus one comma n equals one to let's say fifty. And it should give you a nice 29.845. Yeah, so it should give you a nice number there. Uh, and, and this is going to be a geometric series. We'll figure out how to actually find the sum later. You don't know how to do that yet. Okay, that will come later. But basically, all you're doing is adding up those first, you know, 50 terms for s sub 50. And you're kind of just working at analyzing the sequence of partial sums. Okay. <clears throat> um, you're going to get all kinds of different sums, different like versions of sums. Uh, and, and we're going to want to be able to know whether they converge or diverge. Uh, sometimes you're actually going to be able to figure out what they, what they add up to. Okay, so for example, number three. Um, section, section, I guess, three in my notes, two, three. Yeah, we have telescoping sums. So this is the first kind of sum that you encounter. And it's, it's good because you're actually able to figure out what it will add up to. Okay, so number six, you have the sum of eight all over n times n plus two from n equals one to infinity. And it's, not only, uh, you know, the, the fact that you can get your hands on things, the, the other issue is that um, you can use partial fractions, which is awesome because we just learned how to do that, right? So I'm going to do partial fractions on the nth term formula for the terms of the sum. Okay, so this would be a over n plus b all over n plus 2 multiply through. So let n equal negative 2. So let's say b is negative 4. And then let n equal 0. So a is positive 4. OK. So what I need is the s sub n formula that I can take the, the limit of, right? So usually you would, you would go like s sub 1 is um, you know, it's going to be 8 all over 1 times 3, so 3. And then S sub 2 is going to be 8 all over 3 plus 8 all over 2 times 4, I guess. It would be 8, 2 times 4. Yeah, and then et cetera, right? And then we would have this kth formula, um, so the sum from k equal n equals k, 1 to k of whatever this thing is, this a sub n expression. And then you take the limit of s sub k, and that would kind of tell you whether it was convergent or divergent. If it actually equals something, then uh, we're good. Okay, That will be the answer. So what we're going to do is rewrite this um, as the limit of s sub k. Right. So I'm going to write n equals 1 to k, and then let k go to infinity here. And then I'm going to rewrite this uh, 8 over n times n plus 2 as 4 all over n minus 4 all over n plus 2 from the partial fractions. If you want, you can factor out the 4 from the finite part. You can't take it out of the limit, though. You could just pull out in front of the sum. So if you wanted to, you could rewrite it as this. Oops. You pull the four out in front like this, and then you have the sum from n equals one to k. You can do that with finite sums, but when you have that infinity symbol on it, you can't do that. But anyways, oh, whoops. And of course, then I didn't pull out the four, and it's not letting me grab my eraser. Okay, so like that and that. Anyways, uh, the, so, so we really need this S sub K thingamajig, this formula here, so we could take the limit of it. 
And uh, for the first example we looked at, it was we could we could pull that off, right? We easily could see a formula for S sub K. S sub K was just K, and then we took the limit of it. Down here, it's not quite clear what this formula is, but you can get your hands on it if you do this process. So and it's called telescoping because what you're going to do is kind of un, uh, unfurl it and then collapse it. Okay, so let's see how that works. Okay, so um, I'm going to have n equals 1. So I'm just going to put the first couple terms and then the last couple terms. n equals 2, plus 3, and then plus dot, 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 plus, and then the last three terms I'll put in here. Okay, so this last term, n equals k, then the one before it, n equals 1 less than k, and the one before that, 2 less than k. All right, so, so plug in n equals 1, I get 1 over 1 minus 1 over 3. n equals 2, I get 1 over 2 minus 1 over 4. n equals 3, I get 1 over 3 minus 1 over 5, and then on and on. And then the last couple terms, I got 1 all over k minus 1 over k plus 2. <coughs> 1 before that, 1 over k minus 1, minus 1 over k minus 1 plus 2 is k plus 1. 1 before that is 1 over k minus 2, minus 1 over k minus 2 plus 2 is just 1 over k. And then what you do is look for a pattern of cancellations. Okay. So 1 is not going to cancel, and then the second term, 1 third, will cancel with this guy, right? And then it seems like that's going to be the cancel. So if you were to write n equals 4, what, what would that be? That would be 1 all over 4 minus 1 all over 6. So the 1 over 4, the 1 half isn't going to cancel with anything. But the 1 over 4 will jump the, the, the next uh, binomial and then cancel out and the binomial after that. right? And that turns out to be the pattern. So the one-fifth is going to jump this one and cancel with the next guy. And then the one-sixth is going to jump and cancel with the next guy, et cetera. And then this is going to jump and cancel. And then all the way at the end, um, the one-fourth is canceled, the one-fifth is canceled. All the way at the end, so, so let's see what happens here, right? If we continue on with that pattern. It's the second guy is jumping one and then canceling with the first term. So the second guy here is jumping this one and then canceling with the first term here. So the second guy here will jump this one and cancel with this guy. And then I can see this guy is jumping this term and canceling with this guy. And then that's it, right? So you go ahead and rewrite what you got left over. And that should be your S sub K. So I have the limit as K goes to infinity of 4 times 1 plus 1 half minus 1 over K plus 1 minus 1 over K plus 2. As K goes to infinity, these terms are going to go to 0. The denominators are infinity. So L over infinity forms go to 0. And then this will just be the limit of 4 times 2 halves plus 1 halves is 3 halves, which is equal to 6. Believe it or not, the sum is 6. Okay. Okay. Usually you're not going to be able to get your hands on this S sub K formula, though. Okay. That's not going to be the case. But in 9.2, they kind of give you these simple types of summations where you're able to do that. But in general, you're not going to be able to. What we'll have to develop are all these tests for convergence, like the monotonic bounded test, right? If it's monotonic and bounded, it's convergent. You don't know what it converges to, though. You would not necessarily be able to get your hands on that S sub K formula so you could take the limit of it, right? You would just be able to say, okay, it converges or okay, it diverges. Anyways, in this case, it does converge. Okay, so... Again, you use P partial fraction decomposition. You expand the expression. Look for a cancellation pattern. 
Um, they can be really complicated. A lot of the times, though, it's a real simple cancellation where only the only things left are the first and last terms. Um, once you get your S sub K expression, then take the limit of that, and that tells you what the sum is equal to. Okay, okay. Um, so telescoping, that's your first type. You're going to get about you know, 10 different types of summations, and you're going to have to be able to kind of identify them. Again, it's a vocabulary. It's a basic vocabulary, and you need to have this vocabulary mastered so you can get in there and do your job. Anyways, the, the, the next type of summation is the geometric. We saw a geometric sequence, and the geometric sum is basically the sum of the terms of a geometric sequence. Okay, so if you remember, if you had something like 3, 9, um, 27, etc., the a sub n is going to be a sub 1 times r to the n minus 1, right? So in this case, it's 3. The common ratio is 3, and then that will be 3 to the n. Now what we're going to do, instead of looking at the sequence a sub 1 is 3, and then a sub 2 is 9, and then a sub 3 is 27, etc., our sequence is a sequence of, of partial sums, right? So our first term will be 3, our second term would be 3 plus 9, in other words, 12. The next guy, 3 plus 9 plus 27, which is 39. So instead of given 3, 9, 27, the, the sequence that you are analyzing would be 3, 12, 39, etc. And then again, you, you want to know where the limit is going. In this case, it's clear. I think it's clear that this would be divergent. So the sum of 3 to the n as n goes from, uh, and usually we like to start the geometric sums at 0 rather than 1. So 0 to infinity. So I'm going to have to change this a little bit to n plus 1 to make it work. But this one won't converge. It has to be divergent. Okay. But the formula right here, the, the S sub K formula that we, we would be after, right? So this S sub K critter, it, we don't really know what the formula is off the top of our heads, right? I can tell it's divergent because the, the numbers just seem like they're getting out of control. They're just getting bigger and bigger. I mean, that's not technically a proof or anything because there are sequences of partial sums that will grow so slowly that they'll never about to anything, okay? Um, so, so we need to be much more careful, but um, I, I think in this case we, we can kind of say it's going to be divergent. So how, how can I prove one way or the other whether or not these things converge or diverge, and how do I get the actual answers to these things? Well, um, in the beginning, we, we can just literally give you the formula. Okay, so I have the sum from n equals to infinity, 0 to infinity of AR to the N, that is going to add up to A all over 1 minus R if the absolute value of R is less than 1. Okay. So, uh, for example, the case I was just looking at, I had the sum N equals 0 to infinity of 3 to the N plus 1, which is really just the sum of 3 times 3 to the N from n equals 0 to infinity. So the, the a value here is 3, and the r value is also 3. Um, the absolute value of r is not less than, than 1. It's actually greater than 1. So therefore, it's divergent. Okay, so this does not have a sum. It's divergent because the r value is not less than 1. So compare that to number 4, where I have the sum n equals 0 to infinity of 6 times 2 thirds to the n. Okay. In this problem, the a value is 6, the r value is 2 thirds, so that absolute value of r is actually less than 1, so it is convergent. So in this case, you can, you can get the summation, you can add it all up, basically. So use the formula above there, the a over 1 minus r, so it would be 6 all over 1 minus 2 thirds, which is 6 all over 3 thirds minus 2 thirds is 1 thirds, which will be 18. Okay. 
Okay, let's cruise back to that one problem that I did with Wolfram, wherever that left me at, this guy right here. How do I find part A, the sum of that series? Okay, so it's the sum of three times 0 0.9 to the n minus one from n equals something to infinity. What is that something? n equals one to infinity. Okay, so to get the sum, it needs to be in this exact form, okay? Notice our form starts at zero. Okay, let's borrow this thing. And compare and contrast it, right? So um, I need that lower limit, the n equals one. I need it to be n equals zero. So how am I going to pull that off? Well, it's it's it takes a bit of a leap of faith. What you're going to do is is kind of subtract the one to the other side, like it was an equation. And you get n minus one equals zero to infinity of three times zero point nine to the n minus one. And then you could do a substitution for n minus 1. So you could say like j equals n minus 1, and then you could place n with j plus 1. So this thingamajig here will be the sum from j equals 0 to infinity of 3 times 0 0.9 to the j. And now it's in the form. The j or n, it doesn't really matter. They're just dummy variables. If you want to, you could rewrite it then as n equals 0 to infinity of 3 times 0 0.9 to the n. Um, but but uh, now you can apply the formula and not have to worry about it being off by 1. Okay. So again, the uh, a value in this case is 3. The r value is 9 tenths. 0 0.9 is 9 tenths. That is definitely less than 1. So I could apply the formula, it'll be 3 all over 1 minus 9 tenths, which is 3 all over 10 tenths minus 9 tenths is um, 1 tenths, which is 30, okay? which was the answer that, that you see I already put in there, 30. Okay, so, so that's one small um, detail that we need to work with sometimes. Uh, you need to convert that that lower limit so that it looks like the so that it starts at zero. So it has to be in this form for us to find that summation. In different books will start at n equals one, but then they have to shift over the the a r to the n and make it a r to the n minus one. Okay, so you, you'll see it different different in different books, but but there it is. Okay. Um, Let's look at a couple other of these. So like number um, four. So the terms here are a geometric sequence, right? So 49, 7, negative 7 rather, 1, negative 1 sevenths. Gosh, a sub 1 is 49. And uh, the R value, you just take two terms and make a fraction. So I'll take the first two terms. That's negative one-sevenths. So I could rewrite this as a summation of 49 times negative one-sevenths to the N from N equals zero to infinity. And you could recheck it, right? Um, you could plug in zero into that. You get 49. You plug in one. You get 49 times negative one sevenths to the one, which is 49 times negative one sevenths, which is negative sevenths, uh, etc. Okay, so it works. Um, then it looks like this. This is going to pan out for us. The uh, uh, a value is 49, and then the absolute value of r absolute value of negative one-seventh in this case is positive one-seventh. And uh, that is definitely less than one, so I could apply the formula. So 49 all over one minus, be a little careful, it's negative one-seventh. So it would be 49 all over seven-sevenths plus one-seventh is eight-sevenths. And then multiply by reciprocals, 343 over eight. 
Um, one parlor trick you could do this is the conversion of uh, decimals into fractions, which you may not necessarily have been able to do without um, these kind of this kind of technique here. So let's try like number 10. I want to convert 0 0.619 repeating into a fraction. And I want to do it with geometric series. There's other ways to do it, but we want to use what we were learning here. We want to apply what we learned here. So first I'm going to rewrite it as a summation. Okay. Um, this portion after the 0.6, this stuff right here is a geometric series. Okay. And the terms form a, a, a geometric sequence in, protect, in particular. So the initial value, A, is going to be 0 0.019. And then for the R value, you could just take two consecutive values and divide them. Um, okay, so <laughs> it's uh, tenths, hundredths, thousandths, ten thousandths, one hundred thousandths, nineteen over one hundred thousandths times tens, hundredths, one thousandths, uh, multiplying by reciprocals. So the nineteens cancel, a bunch of zeros cancel, and you're left with one over a hundred for R. Okay, so we could rewrite that then as a sum from n equals 0 to infinity of 0 0.019, the a value. Let's rewrite that as a fraction. So 19 tenths, hundredths, one thousandths times the r value, which is 1 over 100 to the n. Oops, and I forgot the plus 0.6, right? So I, I can't forget that part of it. I'll rewrite 0.6 is 6 tenths. And then for that, at least for the summation part, the A value, you know, the R value, the absolute value of R is 1 over 100, which is definitely less than 1. So you can apply the formula. So we'll have 19 over 1,000 all over 1 minus 100. And that will be 6 tenths plus um, 19 over 1,000 times the reciprocal of 99 one hundredths. So 100 over 99, which would be 6 tenths, 19 all over 990. I'll find a common denominator, so I'm going to have to multiply top and bottom of this dude by 99. And then add it to 19. And 613 over 990. And then get the calculator to see if it worked. Yep. Okay. So kind of a clever party trick, um, but there it is. Anyways, um, there's applications, kind of like physics type, physics types applications in the homework, like number 16. Ah, where are you, homework? Yeah, the ball, the famous ball jumping problem. So you're, you're dropping a ball from 18 feet. Each time it drops 8 feet, it rebounds 0.81 H feet. Um, find the total distance traveled by the bouncing ball. Okay, so the ball is initially dropped. Um, frick. 18 feet. Okay, so it goes. And then it, it rebounds a fraction of that, right? So it's going to rebound up 0.81 of whatever it fell. Okay, so it's going to rebound up. It's going to be 0 0.81 of that original height. And then it's going to fall back down that same height.
and then it rebounds a fraction of that. And we could rewrite that as 0 0.81 squared times 18. So what's going to happen is you get a geometric sum out of it. Right. So the next one goes up a fraction of that. That would be 0 0.81, lost a 1 there, cubed times 18, and so on and so forth. Okay, so what do we have then? We have 18 plus, then double this, you know, every time it, it goes back up, it's going to fall down the same, by the same amount. Okay, so there's, it's going to be two of uh, this sort of geometric sum. So, so the first term is this 0 0.81 times 18. And then the R value is going to be the ratio of 0.81 squared times 18 all over 0 0.81 times 18, which is just 0 0.81 times 0 0.81 squared, um, n equals 0 to infinity, or 8, 0.81 to the n. Okay, so all of this junk then becomes the A value. This thing in here is your R value. And so we get 18 plus 2 times 0 0.81 times 18 all over 1 minus 0.81. And I'm going to default to my calculator this time. I'm use a real calculator, not the Wolfram calculator. Just give me one second. I don't have this done ahead of time, unfortunately. So 18 plus 2 times 0.81 t divided by 1 minus 0.81. And then I have to go into my different mode to get my approximation. And I'm getting 171.2. 474 units for the distance traveled by the ball. Okay. Yeah, that's how it works. Um, great. So, so where does that formula come from? Um, it's it's kind of a clever thing, actually. Uh, so you have the sum from n equals zero to infinity of a r to the n. Um, well, you can write out S sub uh, whatever, say S sub K. That'll be A R to the zero plus A R to the one, et cetera. All the way up to A the R K. And then multiply that by R, that same sum, and subtract. Okay. So if you multiply the sum by R, you would get a times r, which is ar, plus ar times r, which is ar squared, etc. And then ar to the k times r would be ar to the k plus 1. Subtracting that stuff, you get s sub k minus r s sub k equals, and then you get that big cancellation because all that stuff would be minus, right? So this minus this, this minus this. And you're just left with a minus a r to the k plus 1. So factor out the s sub k. Factor out the a over here. Um, and then divide by 1 minus r. And you can kind of see the formula out in front here. So taking the limit of that thing as k goes to infinity, the only variable part, the, the k part, is in the exponent of that r term. So whether or not the series converges, 
uh, in other words, whether or not the limit of the sequence of partial sums goes anywhere is dependent on that R value. Okay, so you consider then um, the limit of this just just this one part. So the limit of R to the K plus one as K goes to infinity, um, and you could you could convert that into an exponential if you like. You could uh, maybe just investigate a little bit. Let's just look at some particular values. So let's say r was 5, right? 5 to the k plus 1. That's going to go off to infinity. So in that case, it would be divergent. But if you had something like um, 1 half, well, that will go to 0. So, th so that's why we have this restriction that the series converges to a over 1 minus r only when the r value, the absolute value of r is less than 1. Okay, it's in those cases when um, the absolute value of r is less than 1, the term right here will be forced to go to 0, and you're left with the constant a over 1 minus r. Otherwise, it's, it's not going to converge. It's just not going to give you any, any limit. Okay. Um, okay, so, so that's the, the, kind of, the kind of quick, big and small of that. Um, getting closer to what we actually want to accomplish, and all this stuff with sequences and series is fun, but what we want to accomplish is a way of kind of figuring out, um, well, ultimately maybe doing integrals of these, these things like this that we, we might not necessarily be able to do via a U substitution or any of the things we learned in chapter um, eight, any of the integral methods we've learned will not work on this integral. What it will turn out is that we can convert this into kind of an infinitely long polynomial, all right? So, it, it, you know, maybe it'll look like one plus um, negative x squared all over two plus x to the fourth all over two squared times 2 factorial minus x to the um, 6 all over 2 um, cubed times 3 factorial, uh, etc. Okay. So, so what we'll find is there, there's going to be kind of this clever way of converting these functions into infinitely long polynomials. And your first taste of that will happen here. Okay. They're called power series representations. This is kind of our ultimate goal. We want to take a function that we all know and love, like sine of x or uh, cosine of x, and convert it into one of these polynomials. Okay, and and the the first you know encounter the our first encounter here is going to be kind of cheap. It's, it's going to not be helpful, but hopefully it'll give you a glimpse of what we want to do. Okay, so we consider the geometric series, n equals 0 to infinity of a r to the n equals a all over 1 minus r. Um, and that happens when the absolute value of r is less than 1. Consider then what happens when we let the a value be rewritten as 1 and then let the r value be rewritten as x. Okay, in that case, we'll have the sum from n equals 0 to infinity of x to the n is equal to 1 over 1 minus x when the absolute value of x is less than 1. Uh, what does that mean? Well, that means we've taken the function f of x equals 1 over 1 minus x, and noted that there is a way to convert that, so long as the x value is less than 1, it, we can convert it into this infinitely long kind of polynomial, which we'll call a power series eventually. So using the summation formula, I could rewrite this 1 over 1 minus x as x to the 0, which is 1, plus x plus x squared plus x cubed plus blah, blah, blah believe it or not, okay? Um, okay, so that's great. 
Um, later, though, it, it's not very useful, right? Because if I want to figure out f of uh, 1 half, I, I'm going to plug it into this function, right? And f of 1 half is 1 over 1 minus 1 half, which is 1 over a half, which is 2. I'm not going to plug that into this 1 plus 1 half plus 1. No, that's silly. I could, okay? The answers would be the same, but it's, it's just silly. I, I would prefer something useful, okay? And then later on, we, we will be able to kind of figure out a way to get our hands on something that's actually useful. For example, sine of x. We'll find that f of x equaling sine of x is equal to x minus x cubed over 3 factorial plus x to the fifth over 5 factorial minus blah, blah, blah. Someday. Okay. So anyways, in the meantime, we have to settle for this kind of cheap uh, knockoff. Um, so whatever, you know, and you're going to see it in the homework. Okay, so number 13, um, I have the sum from n equals 1 to infinity of 7x to the n. Okay. So I, I need to convert it into that nice geometric form the n equals 0 to infinity of a r to the n, right? It's not in that form. So again, I need to play around with this index. So subtract 1 from both sides and then do a substitution. So I'm going to say let k equal n minus 1, and then n will be k plus 1. Um, it's, it's still not quite in the form because we just want k, not k plus 1. So you can just peel off one term, right? So if you have a to the x plus y, that's equal to a to the x times a to the y, right? So I'll rewrite this 7x to the, and I'll swap the order, first power times 7x to the k. Then I can see, all right, the a value is 7x. So I can rewrite this as 7x. And for a, all over 1 minus the r value, which is also 7x. And this will be true if the absolute value of 7x is less than 1. In the homework, they want an actual interval, I believe. So you got to put it as an interval. Yeah. So you could rewrite this guy as 7x less than 1 greater than negative 1, and then divide all three sides by 7. And you're good to go. So the, the interval of convergence would be going from negative 1 7th to 1 7th. So you could use that formula. You could use the summation, uh, this infinite sum, this infinite series, in place of 7x over 1 minus 7x, so long as your x value is in that interval. It's kind of lame, because if your x value is in that interval, you would just use that number. But what I'm saying is eventually we'll be able to do kind of stuff like this, and it'll be useful, because we'll be able to replace like sine of x and exponentials, and then we can do integrals of polynomials pretty easily, as opposed to doing maybe an integral of something crazy. Okay. Um, Okay, let's make this, uh, this, I'm going to give you a similar problem for the quiz. So um, same type of problem, rewrite it as a function. So let's see what the actual directions are in the homework. So it wants you to find all values of x for which the series converges. And then for these values of x, write the sum of the series as a function of x. Okay, so the function in this previous problem was 7x all over 1 minus 7x. And then the interval of convergence, the IOC, is the one negative 1 7. So I need to see those two answers after you, and show me all your work, OK? okay. So here, here's the problem. I'll make it really similar. So that's the video quiz. Okay, let me do just one more um, from the homework. 
because people often ask me about this problem and I just want to get it off my chest before I get 100 emails. Um, so we got 9 all over x to the n. Okay, so this guy is already in our form. Um, the a value is just 1, and then the r value is at 9 over x. Okay, so we could plop it into our formula. It would be 1 all over 1 minus 9 over x. And they don't want that complex fraction in there, so you're going to multiply top and bottom by x to get rid of the complex fraction. The complex fraction is like 1 over 2 over 3 over 7 over 8. Yeah. So I get x all over distributing the x to the denominator. I'll have x minus 9. So there's my function. And then uh, it works in the interval of 9 over x less than 1. Okay, so, so this then is a troublemaker, right? So what the heck does that even mean? Um, you, you can kind of approach it by kind of finding the uh, zeros, the places where 9 over x minus 1 would equal um, 0, in particular the absolute value of that. So it's going to be x equals negative 9 or x equals positive 9. And then you want to know where basically this thing is less than 0, right? So if you have 9 over x minus 1, um, less than, find where that thing is less than zero. Okay, so you could do a number line and then uh, plug in values. Okay, so uh, if you plug in like negative 10 into this expression, um, 9 over negative 10, absolute value is 9 tenths, minus 1 is uh, negative, so that interval is good. And then plug in zero. Well, I guess you can't plug in zero. That won't work. Plug in something like one. So nine over one is nine. That's positive. So it's going to be positive in here, with the exception of that that one place where it's where it's undefined. Uh, so it won't work anywhere in here um, around that that discontinuity. And then when it's bigger than 9, again, you're going to get a negative value. So the places where the absolute value of 9 over x minus 1 is less than 0, in other words, where 9 over x absolute value of is less than 1, will be the interval from negative infinity to negative 9, and then union with um, 9 to infinity. And you have to use the little symbols in calc chat on the side if you, did, if you didn't see those already, um, the calc pad. So there's sets, and then you have to use the, the U symbols. So hopefully you, you're, I've had some emails about these. So every once in a while you have to go through and kind of find like the delta symbol. Um, if you take out three, you'll need the vectors. Okay. okay, I mean, there's other ways to approach this. You could literally graph the thing. So the absolute value of 9 minus x um, will look like this. And then you just want to figure where that's less than... Um, the line y equals 1, and that will be from uh, negative infinity all the way up here to, to negative 9, and then uh, positive 9 to infinity. Okay, so there's a couple ways you can approach it. That's just the, the way I think of it. Okay, so hopefully that, that helps. As usual, thank you for watching, and I'll see you next time.